independent sources. I'm Abby Ashola. And I'm Gary Pierre Pierre. Just weeks after attending the G20 gathering in London, President Obama is preparing for another major meeting with heads of state. The fifth summit of the Americas kicks off on Friday in Trinidad and Tobago, where Obama will share the stage with 33 other leaders from the Western Hemisphere. On this edition of Independent Sources, we get a preview of the summit from experts on Latin America and the Caribbean. Two topics could dominate the discussions, the economic crisis and Cuba. We learn about problems with water around the world. And we meet some journalists with feet in two worlds. We'll have those stories in News of the Week after this. I think ethnic media is freedom. It's kind of freedom to really serve your reader, your public, you know, your, in my case, you know, Latino community. And I think that whereas in the past people wanted to be in mainstream, I think today people in mainstream envy us in ethnic media because we're very targeted. The three-day summit of the Americas convenes later this week in Trinidad and Tobago. Leaders from all over the Western Hemisphere are scheduled to attend, but no one from the country that could be a touchy topic of discussion, Cuba. Here with me to discuss what may happen at the forum is Greg Grandham of the North America Congress on Latin America, or NACLA. Also joining us is Felicia Perso, editor-in-chief of the website CaribWorldNews.com. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This week, Obama lifted travel restrictions for Cuban Americans going back home. Now, his administration has said that, you know, they don't want Cuba to be the center of attention during that summit. Is this sending mixed signals? Well, the, the mixed signals, I think, has been a sign of things past, things to come, things in the present. The, the, the administration is in a bit of a bind. It has to appease Latin America, who's been demanding for a normalization of, of, uh, of relations with Cuba, ending the Cold War, ending the embargo, letting Cuba join the OAS, while at the same time having to appease domestic interests, basically Florida and New Jersey. Okay. We, uh, those are two states with large an influential Cuban American and one and the one Democratic senator in Florida and and one in two in New Jersey, but one one Cuban American, Bob Menendez, okay. who is very much interested in maintaining the status quo. I think of, of Cuba. Why has America been so tough on Cuba? Well, I mean, if you look at the history, Gary, it's been obvious. You know why? I mean, America once was you know using Cuba as a playground um, for 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 many years. And then Cuba pretty much had the revolution. So since then, you've seen this hardening. And under the Bush administration, you saw a further hardening, which was just, you know, horrific mm -hmm. um, in many quarters. So what has happened is that the second generation, third generation Cuban-American voters who helped elect uh, President Obama are not seeing the same things that their their parents saw. So they're calling for, for let, let's lessen this, this pressure. And I think that is the pressure that the administration is feeling that is why we're seeing so many changes that are coming along beginning today, as we've seen with, with some easing of the travel restrictions for Cuban Americans. Exactly. Uh, you know, Jeffrey Davido, uh, he's been very quoted all over the place. Coming so early in the administration, this legitimately can be seen as a new beginning. I mean, do you think this conference will set a different tone from what has been the case in the past, where, uh, you know, the U.S. has dictated the agenda, or is it going to be uh, business as usual? Well, I think, I mean, President Obama is a different uh, kind of U.S. president. So he has said through, through uh, Ambassador Davido that he's going to the Caribbean to listen uh, to leaders. So I think it's up to the Caribbean leaders to really come up with, with an agenda that can, can have him really listening and actually doing something. I don't see that happening. I haven't seen any real agenda coming out of, of our Caribbean leadership. What's happening with the Latin American leaders? Greg? Yeah, well, I also just want to touch on that. I think all things being equal, Obama would like to normalize relations with, improve Latin American relations with, with Latin America. But for the very same reason, how domestic interests are preventing him from actually fully normalizing relations with Cuba on a whole range of things. Domestic interests are what's the obstacle to real progress in terms of hemispheric relations. For instance, Hillary Clinton just recently said a number of actually good things about the Mexican war on drugs and drug fuel 
fueled violence, saying that it was the United States consumption of drugs, Absolutely. but also but also the the send the, but the small the, um, the sending um, weapons yeah. down to you know send the guns and weapons down to Mexico uh, the NRA immediately the National Rifle Association immediately jumped on that and, and made it clear that they weren't going to allow any restrictions placed on the gun trade that would you know using Mexico as a way of restricting the gun trade uh, Obama, while he was a senator, sponsored the Jubilee Act, which was to forgive the, some of the debt of some of, of the poorest Latin American countries. And I'm sure all things being equal, he would actually like to continue that. But the Democratic Party's beholding to Wall Street, which we've certainly seen in the last couple of months, mm -hmm. uh, is, is not going to let any uh, allow any major structural reforms in terms of debt in okay. Latin America. Getting back to Cuba, uh, it seems that Cuba's two biggest allies is uh, Chavez and uh, Morales. Uh, do you think their approach to Obama, the, the discussions will be conciliatory or confrontational, confrontational when uh, they're trying to advocate why Cuba should be part of the OAS? Well, I think they'll be conciliatory. I think Chavez has already signaled, and certainly over the last couple of months, but also in the next, last couple of days, that willing to try to establish good relations with Obama. I think it's in his interest to do it. But ultimately, there's no real... The conflict between Venezuela and the U.S. is really about the United States. Again, this is was all, it about Bush or the United States? Well, what do you think? I think I think the United States. I think there's interest in the United States that need to demonize certain certain countries, particularly when they stand up to the United States. In the, in the particular case of Obama, he has there's no payoff to normalizing relationship with Venezuela because if he does, he'll get slammed by the right. There's other real danger spots in Afghanistan and Pakistan where he does have to moderate U.S. rhetoric and hopefully change U.S. policy. But in order to do that, he can't, he can't appear weak on all fronts. So just for instance, just let me say quickly, a few, a few weeks ago, he sent out a few signals of, about normalizing and softening the hard line against Venezuela. And he was attacked by the Wall Street Journal, by the Heritage Foundation, and they immediately backed but, off. But uh, you, also, you expect that, uh, Felicia, don't you? I mean, absolutely, the, the absolutely. I think, it's, I think uh, Chavez is sort of showing a softening of his approach. And I think with President Obama being who he is, will um, you know if Chavez reaches out his hand? I mean, I'm interesting to see that picture if Obama actually you know shakes his hand. Um, I know the aides will sort of try to keep them away, but I think you know it's a beginning, and he sent a strong signal in Europe of how he wants to to bring the world together. And I think it will be the same attitude in the Caribbean at this summit. Mm -hmm. Speaking of the Caribbean at the summit, now uh, one of the benefactors of Cuba's isolation has been the Caribbean. Uh, now, how do Caribbean leaders feel about Cuba, if you will, joining the fold once again? Uh, would that uh, undermine their own economic prosperity? I don't think so. I think the Caribbean has been uh, very, very um, supportive of Cuba. I mean, they've benefited from medical uh, personnel. They've benefited from a lot of things. In fact, the Trinidadian prime minister was there in Cuba getting free medical care only months ago. So I think they're very supportive, but, but they haven't been as upfront with their support. Very few countries, including Dominica and St. Vincent, where the leaders are more you know, outspoken, they have actually said that they're supportive of Cuba. But I think the Caribbean of its whole has not really said a major agenda, and that is worrying to a lot of people, especially here in the diaspora. It's interesting you brought up uh, the Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago, uh, Patrick Manning, who on the record said he didn't want Cuba at the meeting. He's not supporting Cuba. Well, that is very interesting, considering that he, he was actually a beneficiary of free medical care from Cuba. Um, so it's very interesting. But I think these guys play their politics very close, and they're trying to get in with the U.S. and sort of stay uh, you know, in the fold with that. And I think that is part of the reasons we're seeing that sort of division. And Greg, uh, from a Latin American standpoint, what is their uh, interest in having Cuba back into the fold. There's been a long-standing demand that the United States normalize relations with with Cuba. I mean, Brazil's been leading it. It's not. It hasn't just been Venezuela or Bolivia. Brazil has been a, a big, a, very much interested in this, and not just for idealistic or solidarity reasons. Brazil's agro industry would would stand would actually probably be the one that would modernize Cuba's agricultural sector, and that would give them a, 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 a portal into the United States, a close United States market. Brazil has been demanding access. To 
to the U.S. as agricultural. And this is this will be a sticking point where Brazil and Lula have been demanding that the United States lower its agricultural tariffs, import tariffs, and, and lower its subsidies. Um, and we'll see if this is another in, another domestic issue that, that will affect Obama's will, ability to deliver in, in, in Trinidad. Felicia, what's going on? Uh, why isn't anyone stepping up and articulating uh, a vision for the region vis-a-vis -vis the United States? I mean, I just think they're so excited by having President Obama go to the summit that they've just lost track of um, the reality. And the re yeah, exactly. And I think if he wasn't going to the summit, the summit would be pretty much, you know, Dottie, we wouldn't even be having much of a conversation about it. Um, I think they haven't done much consultation with their own people to realize what even is happening. And here in the diaspora, the voters who helped elect the president and who could actually have some say. We haven't seen any kind of issue. So we're not seeing Haiti on the agenda anywhere. We're not seeing immigration reform, which Obama is also trying to lean towards, and which the Caribbean leaders should sort of reiterate at the summit. Nothing is happening except, I guess, the economic um, reform and what is happening in the world, and also climate change. Those are just two of the major issues which have been just on, you know, on the ground always at these at the table. I think also the OAS uh, and some people, diplomats in the OAS, are saying it's looking like a talk shop because the agenda seems like a re repeat of other summits, and that is also a concern. We'll have to leave it at that. Greg Grendon of NACLA, Felicia Persso of CaribNewsWorld.com, thanks for joining us. Now here's Zyphus LeBrun with some other news. Thanks, Gary. Here's a look at some headlines from the ethnic media. The Amsterdam News reports that MS-13, a violent international street gang, has infiltrated several areas on Long Island. The Central American gang is known for leaving dismembered corpses and decapitated heads at their crime scenes. Marquez Claxton, co-founder of 100 Blacks in Law Enforcement Who Care, says the NYPD is in denial about the danger of MS-13 and is not equipped to handle gang prevention. Caribbean Life reports that residents in Canarsie are battling a proposal to put a medical waste transfer station in their area. They say it would violate zoning laws and pose danger to their health. The project's developers plan to fight any laws that prohibit the plan. From Black Star News, the U.S. African Chamber of Commerce wants CNN to highlight African immigrants in its ongoing Black in America series. The group says the stories of blacks in America is incomplete without emphasizing the contributions this growing population has made in the U.S. There are over two million African immigrants in America. Jewish and Muslim leaders have saved medical examiners across the state from having their budgets slashed. Judaism and Islam require speedy burials, so leaders from both faiths warned lawmakers that reducing funds for medical examiners could lead to delays in funerals. About half of all deaths require a certificate from medical examiners before a burial can take place. And finally, the Haitian Times says cellular phone technology is archaic in Haiti. The newspaper reports that the most popular cell phone company on the island only offers prepaid service at inflated prices. According to the Haitian Times, the government is believed to be in cahoots with private phone companies. Those are just a few headlines from the ethnic media. Back to Abby in the studio. Water, water everywhere, and not a drop to drink. Water constitutes about three quarters of the Earth's surface, but there's a worldwide water crisis. According to the UN, more than a billion people lack access to clean water. Two and a half billion are without water for proper sanitation. Karen Khalid has been reporting on the water shortage in Ethiopia. Karen, thanks for being with us. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Well, your reporting in Ethiopia came out of a water conference in Istanbul. Talk about that experience. Well, um, it was a reporting fellowship, and its primary focus was to cover the world water crisis. And they had a um, group of journalists from all over the world, developing countries that are impacted by this issue. And they also had a contingency of American journalists, because we're the ones who neglect the issue the most. It's actually ethnic media that covers it, because it affects their communities directly, whereas in the United States, it's primarily felt in regions like the Southwest, where they have droughts and whatnot. So we started with the World Water Forum, which occurred in Istanbul, and it was a conference of leaders in the industry in terms of providing solutions. It was NGOs that had been created to combat the problem, and also some ministers who were there to basically talk about what their countries were doing on their end to resolve the crisis. And from 
there we went on to field study, which in my case was in Ethiopia. We actually have some footage of your trip to Ethiopia. Um, what are we seeing here? Okay, so what we're seeing right here is the uh, Kaki River, which runs through Addis Ababa, the capital city of Ethiopia. And as you can see, it's filthy. Right here, there's footage of people who are literally dumping trash into the river. And they're not the only offenders. Everyone does this. And it's, at this point, so filthy, the question is, why not? I mean, look at the debris and the amount of pollution running through there. So and are they drinking this water? They claim that they're not drinking it, but it is being used for irrigation. And right here you can see it's got a blue tint to it, almost like Windex. That's because a nearby textile factory is also dumping their dyes into the water. And here the water is literally bubbling because of the amount of methane in there, and that's from animal carcasses from a nearby tannery. People have to go to the top of the river, as seen here, to get any clean water. And that's because this is before it passes through the city and the level of pollution that we just saw. So what else are they using this particular river for besides? Well, they claim that they have to, they, they can't use it, that this oh. is, they're having to bypass a major source of water because of the level of pollution. And that explains yeah. why Ethiopia ranks in the bottom of the world when it comes to access to clean water and sanitation. Are people cooking with this water? What else are they using the water for? They're using the water for irrigation um, in terms of agriculture and crops, which, if you think about it, is really dangerous because it's impacting the produce that they're eventually eating. Um, they're we, all we actually have footage of a man that you spoke to that kind of mentions that. Do you use this water? For, uh, no, at this time, no. Nobody uses this water because it is contaminated by painting and other dirty Farmers are using it for their uh, irrigation. There is a, over there, uh, there is a irrigation. For the irrigation, they use it. Is that safe? No, it is not safe. The smell is very bad. They cause sinus and so many difficulties. Well, he mentions that he has sinus problems from the water. What other kind of medical issues are affecting people there? Well, um, just to mention, Abby, since you brought that up, the smell is so overpowering. My camera woman works frequently in Baghdad where she's had to go out into the battlefield and she's been around a lot of decaying corpses. And she said that the smell is pungent there along the river as it was when she went out into those conditions. And these people, even though they're living in it and breathing it frequently, it still affects them to the extent that it's irritating their sinuses. I couldn't breathe without something covering my nose and mouth. Um, that's just the tip of the ice when it comes to the problems that people encounter in terms of their health. Um, TB, malaria, and um, AIDS combined do not cause as many deaths of children in these developing countries as waterborne illnesses and um, diseases related to poor sanitation. So it's really staggering when you think about the impact. And this isn't something that requires a cure like AIDS. This is simply access to clean water. It's very easy for us to solve this global health crisis. And it's really alarming as a journalist that more of us in the media aren't covering it. So why do you think the media isn't covering the issue? I think it's not a sexy story. It's about water. It's about people who don't have access to latrines and proper sanitation, so they're practicing open defecation. I mean, wow. that's not something that people like to hear about or talk about. Or but see on television. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And, you know, you're going to be hard-pressed to find advertisers that want their advertising butted up against a story like that. So it, I, I, I see the challenges, but I also understand that as a journalist and as media as a whole, especially Western media, because we have such a pervasive impact throughout the world and because so many NGOs are funded by people in the Western world, that it's our responsibility to really cover this issue more thoroughly. You also spoke to some female farmers in the area. What are they doing here? Well, they're basically demonstrating to us how the pollution that washes up um, along their end of the river affects their farming. As you can see here, they're showing us how the plastic bags from just a deluge of debris that comes down that river is literally blocking the roots. And they spend so much time excavating the trash from their cropland that it hinders their ability to harvest the rest of their crop. And by the time they get it all cleaned up, the rains hit again, 
and they have to start all over again because there's like another mountain of trash to sort through. So I'm sure it's affecting their business. Absolutely it is. It's affecting their productivity, which wow. is one of the major reasons that uh, poor access to water mm -hmm. and clean water has such an impact on an economy overall in a developing country. It's wow. not just the fact that they're not able to harvest more. It's because people are sick more, and therefore they're not as productive in society as they could be. Wow. So what is the UN saying about the situation? In terms of the water crisis, the, um, it is one of the Millennium Development Goals that the UN had set out. Uh, they have stopped short of declaring water as a human right. There is no UN formal official language. Um, it's been likened to genocide where they just haven't taken that step. And a lot of people back off from saying it's a human right because water is going to continue to be scarce. It's going to become progressively more scarce um, as the population grows and as competing sources for water and take there have hold. there tribal wars, I hear, right? Right. Um, wherever you put a well, you have to be very cognizant of the ethnic boundary lines because if it's along one of those rival areas, then you do have a conflict. In fact, we spoke to people both on the NGO side and on the government side who agree that water is going to be the source of world wars more so than oil has because unlike oil, there is no alternative source for water. It is a finite resource that we have. Mm. So what about the privatization debate? I know there's been the privatization debate is one of the things that a lot of people claim is hindering the progress in this area of development. Basically, there's two camps, and one says that water is a human right, that it should be available to the poorest of the poor, that they shouldn't be charged for it. And then the people who are pro-privatization think that the infrastructure needs to be funded by private industry, that they need to come over and take over the infrastructure and control access to water. But people who are the end users, which is the consumer basically, are saying that whenever private industry has come in, it happened in Cochabamba and it happened in Manila, whenever private industry has come in and taken over the water structure, it has resulted in corruption, a lack of transparency in terms of investment and delivery. And in Manila, for example, private industry came in and according to people we spoke with in our reporting, they actually just took over the infrastructure that was built by the local community. They didn't add anything to the infrastructure and then started taxing people for the infrastructure that they had built. So they were suddenly paying for water through a resource which they themselves had commissioned. So this industry was just reaping the rewards of their labor without really providing anything. And whenever you have privatization of any industry, it creates a big fear about profiting from something that should be a right to everyone, especially when it has such a vast impact on human life. So what are the solutions? What, it, what was discussed at the conference as far as fixing the problem? That's a, that's a good question. Um, the solution, according to some a NGOs, such as water advocates, is that you have to employ private industry. It needs to be a private public partnership. Mm -hmm. So if you have private industry invest money, and, and the return is great, you can get any, for every dollar invested in infrastructure as far as water is concerned, you reap seven to thirty-four dollars. Wow. So there is a profit motive, mm -hmm. but if they're if they're confined to only covering the infrastructure and not charging for the water itself, but the delivery and the sanitation of that water, the delivery of clean and safe water, then you can have a situation where people can benefit from access and clean access and the industry still makes it pro its profit and the way that the end user, the poorest of the poor receives it is that they're subsidized by people at a higher income level. So it's a difficult paradigm to achieve, mm -hmm. but that's what's claimed as the win-win situation by people who are in the middle of the argument. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have. Thanks for being with us, Karen Khalid. Thank you for having me. We'll be right back. The Feet in Two Worlds project is a collaboration between ethnic and mainstream media, whether the topic is education or immigration, local politics or foreign policy, 
partnerships like this are becoming increasingly valuable in bringing different perspective to a wider audience. Zyphus LeBrun has more. When John Rudolph covered the Democratic and Republican conventions, it was not his first time covering such events. However, it was his first time doing so with a group of reporters from the ethnic media. Watching the democratic process up close and watching reporters for ethnic media who don't normally get to watch it up close is, is really wonderful. And to see how they approach the different uh, stories and the kinds of questions that they ask, uh, both of the newsmakers and of each other, is, it's, it's a fascinating process. It's these sorts of questions about the rights and plights of immigrants that prompted Rudolph to produce the first Feeton Two Worlds documentary in 2005. Originally, he thought to immerse himself in immigrant communities to tell their stories. Then, he found a better way. We came up with this idea of finding newspaper reporters who write for ethnic newspapers, training them to be radio producers, and incorporating their stories in this documentary. My name is Ewa Kadniendrachowska. I'm a reporter for Nowodzienny, the Polish Daily News. And this is Greenpoint in Brooklyn. I wanted to show you this place because this is where most Poles come when they first arrive in the States. It's a working class neighborhood. Avakarin Yendrachowska was one of the three reporters who worked on the first documentary. The hour long production, narrated by author Frank McCourt, was a great success. You arrive here as an immigrant and make a new life for yourself, but you never completely leave the country where you were born. It won the New America Award from the Society of Professional Journalists. Since then, Rudolf and his team have continued production of new features. Another of Jędrzejowska's stories focused on a Polish worker stricken with cancer after working cleanup at Ground Zero. The one-shot project now has an extensive website where contributors publish their stories and make blog entries. Rudolph has also organized panel discussions dissecting immigrant issues. Uh, Lotus, um, what is the, uh, you know, how do Chinese voters uh, respond to the notion of, of potentially a, a voting for a, a black man for president? A vital part of this project is the partnership with WNYC Radio. The station has aired the stories and provided technical training for the reporters we have a mentoring system so once the reporter is chosen on the basis of his or her story ideas and their interest and willingness to work in radio then we assign them a mentor and they work very closely that with that person on all aspects of the story whether it's um, microphone technique or field recording sound out in the street or in an event or script writing or choosing actuality or all the kinds of issues that come up in radio production the mentor is there to help the reporter work through those issues the program keeps growing they recently expanded to los angeles rudolph hopes feet into worlds can find new contributors in areas like chicago and atlanta areas where he says there are big immigrant populations a lot of ethnic media and of course public radio Zyphus Lebrun, Independent Sources. That's our show. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you again next week. In the meantime, be independent-minded.